We saw how that David had uh, faced a giant, a huge giant, powerful giant, a well-equipped giant who wanted to destroy him. And yet David had been able to win the victory. He, he defeated, defeated that giant. And we saw that his victory had actually been won before he ever stepped on the field of battle. It was already won before he ever stepped on the field of battle. His, his victory was won because of the fact that he chose, he chose a great philosophy by which he would live his life. Uh, you remember we saw there were three points to that philosophy. Uh, first of all, there was, uh, there was the idea, God can use me. God can use me. And, and the second point of that philosophy was, God can use me like I am. You don't have to be somebody else. God can use you just like you are. In fact, he equipped you. He gave you your talents. He gave you, he gave you a, your abilities because he has a plan that could be accomplished through those things that God gifted you with. And so David understood God can use me. Uh, he can use me uh, like I am. And, and then there was another one, and that was this. God can use me like I am right now. He can use me like I am right now. But you remember there was more to David's victory than merely having a great philosophy of life. There was more to it than that. And, and that's why you remember we saw in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 40 that as David was going to the battlefield, he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Now, the same is true for us. Uh, we must have a proper philosophy, and we also must arm ourselves with five stones of godly character that will allow us to be victorious over the giants that Satan sends into our lives to, to hinder us, uh, to discourage us, to sidetrack us in our walk, with God. So last week you remember we saw the first stone. It was the stone of the stone of wisdom. The stone of wisdom. Uh, this stone of wisdom enables us to basically defeat the giant of bad choices. To defeat the giant of bad choices. You remember we saw that wisdom is actually it's the destination of a journey. It's the destination of a journey. It begins with knowledge. Knowledge that comes from hearing the Word of God, learning the fear of the Lord. That's, that, that, that's where it begins. It begins with knowledge, and then it, it continues with understanding. Understanding, that comes from experiencing the consequences of, that come from, from obeying God, and, and also the negative consequences that come from disobeying God. And so there's this, there's, you get knowledge, and then from that comes understanding from the, from the experiences of life. And then, and then from that, finally, you arrive, uh, you arrive at wisdom, which, which is constantly and consistently making good choices, godly choices in your life. Bottom line, to be victorious over the giant of bad choices, ungodly choices, uh, sinful choices. Uh, the, 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 the way to win victory is we, we have to have that stone. We have to have the stone of wisdom. But now we want to consider a second stone that we need in our, in our arsenal, and that is the stone of determination. The stone of determination. Now, I want to begin this evening by giving you two examples uh, to help you to understand exactly what it is that we're talking about when we talk about the stone of determination. You remember, first of all, the Lord Jesus. He is our great example. And so, and so the Lord Jesus, you remember, came to this earth some 2,000 years ago, and he came for a single purpose. He came for a single purpose. And the single purpose was that he might go to the cross of Calvary, take our sins upon himself, die in our place to secure a way of salvation for whosoever will that would believe 
on him. But but that thing that he anticipated, that thing that that he was sent to do was not a pleasant thing. It was not an easy thing. And, and it was true that it was not easy because it would involve two things. First of all, it would involve being beaten with a Roman cat of nine tails. Now, let me tell you what that is. It, it, it's a whip that was made of nine leather strips. It was a whip made of nine leather strips that were attached to a wooden handle. And each one of those nine leather strips would, would have sharp pieces of, of metal or stone embedded in them. And as the lashes would lay across the back and then wrap around the side to the front, uh, that those, those sharp pieces would, would literally dig into the flesh. And then as it was ripped back by the soldier who was applying the beating, uh, those, those sharp points would literally rip open the flesh. It's such a violent beating that historically it has been said that many victims were disemboweled at the whipping post. In other words, their muscles were so ripped open that their insides literally fell out and they would, they would die before they were ever crucified. But then if the victim survived that, then it would involve having his hands and his feet nailed to a wooden cross in a position that would make it difficult to breathe. Because he's hanging with his arms outstended in order to breathe properly, inhale, exhale, he would literally have to stand up on the nails or pull himself up on the nails that were in his hands in order that he could exhale and then, and then inhale again. And of course, to do that meant what? He's rubbing his back that has been brutally beaten He's rubbing that up and down on a, on a rough wooden post. The agony is undescribable. The agony is undescribable. In fact, it is such a terrible, uh, such a terrible way to die that, that the Roman statesman Cicero, he lived back in 43 BC, he called crucifixion, here's what his, his, his description, he said it is a most cruel and disgusting penalty. Now that's from a Roman. And that was his view of this death that Jesus Christ was going to die. But here's the thing I want you to notice. The Lord Jesus knew what was waiting for him. He, he knew what was coming. He knew the price that he would have to pay for my salvation, for, for your salvation. He, he knew exactly what it was that he was going to be facing and what he would soon be suffering. And yet the Bible says this, very interesting, a very interesting verse in Luke chapter 9, verse number 51. It came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he, notice it, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, the Lord Jesus used the stone of determination. He used the stone of determination. He boldly marched toward Calvary. He did not allow his personal feelings. He did not allow his personal desires. He did not allow his personal comforts to hinder him, to stop him from fulfilling the task that his heavenly father had given to him. He set his face steadfastly and refused to be turned. That's the stone of determination, okay? That's the stone of determination. That's the example of the Lord Jesus. Let me give you another example, uh, and, and that would be the example of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, you remember, in Acts chapter 13, was called to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. But that message was not, <laughs> it was not always welcomed, was it? The, the message that he carried was not always appreciated. It was not always welcomed. In, in fact, for the Apostle Paul, it resulted in, in, in many hardships. In fact, later you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 down to verse number 28, and, and you can read the things that the Apostle Paul suffered because of his witness for Christ. 
You, you can read how that he was beaten and how that he suffered shipwreck and he suffered he suffered uh, being naked and being cold and 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 all of the things that he endured uh, for the cause of Christ. And yet the apostle Paul refused to turn back. He, he refused to resign from God's call on his life. Rather, he pulled out the stone of determination from his arsenal. And here's what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he said, I determined. I determined. In other words, I have I've judged the options and I have made a firm, unchangeable decision. I'm determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, the bottom line is simply this. If, if we, like the Lord Jesus and, and the Apostle Paul, are going to defeat those giants that would seek to discourage us, that would seek to hinder us from doing the will of our Heavenly Father, hinder us from becoming what our Heavenly Father desires for us to become, then we must have in our arsenal this stone of determination that is made up of an absolute confidence. Get this, this is a key point. It's not confidence in my ability, but it's confidence in the faithful promises of God. That, that's, that's the makeup of the stone of determination. It's not my thinking or my abilities or my strengths, but it's a confidence in the faithful promises of God. Now, as we consider this point this evening, there are two specific giants, two specific giants that we all are going to face. All of us are going to face these two giants, and yet these two giants can be defeated, even though they are they're quite frightening, they're quite... Uh, they're, they're, they're quite fierce, as, as some would say. Uh, they're, 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 they're giants that, that can cause us to quake and to tremble, and yet they, they can be overcome. They can be defeated with this stone of determination. So let's notice these two giants together. Uh, number one, there's the giant of fear. The giant of fear. In, in Proverbs chapter 29, we find... The Bible says that the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Now this giant of fear, here we find his full name. His full name is fear of man. That, that's his full name. A sad illustration of how this giant works is found in the history of the nation of Israel. Three things that we can remember from their history. First of all, uh, their promise. This was the, the promise that they had received uh, even before they departed out of the land of Egypt and from Egyptian bondage. Uh, there was a promise that was given to them. Here's what the Lord God said, Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. He said, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land Okay, I'm going to take you. Remember, this is a twofold promise. First part, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. That's part one. Here's part two. And bring them into a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So this was the promise. This was, this was the promise that God gave to the nation of Israel. I'm going to bring you out, but I'm not going to leave you in the wilderness. I'm going to bring you in. And the land that I bring you into, oh, it's going to be a good land. It's going to be a good land. It's going to be a land that's flowing with milk, a land that's flowing with honey. In fact, one day people are going to change the name to Singapore. I just want to see if you were paying attention, okay? No, that's not it, is it? But, but it's a good land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. That was their promise. Notice number, or letter B, their observation. Their observation. Uh, Israel had seen how the Lord God had destroyed Egypt's land. They, they had seen how the Lord God had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. They, they had seen how that the Lord God at the Red Sea had saved them from the Egyptian army. They had seen all of those things. 
And then after 40 days of spying out the land, when, when the 10 or the 12 spies returned, uh, they, they came back, and, 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 and I want you to notice the report that they gave. And the report was basically this land that God has brought us to, it's exactly like what God said it would be. It's exactly like that. Now look at it, Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. Here's the report. We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely, just like God said, just like God promised, guess what? It really does. It flows with milk and honey. And, and this right here, what we're bringing on these poles, these bunches of grapes and all these, this, this is the fruit of it, the evidence of it. But then the giant of fear showed up. The giant of fear showed up and stood against them. And we see the result of the confrontation in their reports. We find two things. First of all, there is the fearfulness of the ten. The fearfulness of the ten. There were ten of those twelve spies, and here was their report. Nevertheless, oh yeah, it's a good land. Oh my goodness, it's exactly like what God said. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. By the way, who are those children of Anak? You know who they are? If, if you look down at verse number 33, you'll find out the children of Anak, they're giants. They're giants. This is the giant of fear that, is, that has come up on them. And, and the bottom line is simply that in spite of all the amazing things they had, that they had seen, because they doubted the ability of the Lord God to give them the land that he had promised to them, the stone of determination was missing in their arsenal. It was missing, and therefore the giant of fear conquered them. The giant of fear conquered them. That's the ten. But then I want you to notice there's the not the fearfulness, but the fearlessness of the two. The fearlessness of the two. And of course, those two were, were, were Caleb and Benjamin. I mean, Caleb and Joshua. Okay. <laughs> Caleb and Joshua. Okay. Uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse number 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. In other words, he said, okay, calm down, settle down, settle down. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Because of their confidence in the promises of the Lord God, Caleb and Joshua, they had that stone of determination. They, they had that stone of determination in their arsenal, and with that stone, they were able to overcome the giant of fear. They were able to overcome the giant of fear who desired to conquer their hearts and cause them to dishonor and disobey their God. Now, I want you to understand that we do not face literal giants like Israel did. We, we don't face literal giants. However, when, when we are faced with, with peer pressure, and a lot of times we use that phrase talking about teenagers, oh, the, the peer pressure that they face. Let me tell you something. Adults face peer pressure too. We, we do. And, and when it comes to this thing of peer pressure, when those who are around us are seeking to lead us to, to do things or to say things that are, that are not wise, that are not right, that are not pleasing to God, 
When, when, when the crowd begins to talk and, and try to lead us in a, in a bad way, that is, when the, that is when the giant of fear, we ugly critter, isn't he? That's when the giant of fear is going to show up. He's going to show up, he's going to rise up, and he's going to cause us to forget about the promises of God and to start focusing on what people will think of us. Or he'll cause us to focus on what people will say about us. Or he'll cause us to think about what people might do to us. The sad fact is, is that many believers will never be successful in their Christian life because the giant of fear has defeated them. The giant of fear has defeated them and caused them many times to give up before they ever began. But before they ever go on the battlefield, they've already lost. And so they give up before they ever begin, or, or they, they get started, but then they, they quit, or they surrender, or they throw in the towel just because things got a little difficult. But bottom line, we need the stone of determination. We need the stone of determination, again, a stone that is made from an absolute confidence in the faithfulness of God in our arsenal if we're going to defeat this giant of fear. But then I want you to notice that same stone of determination, it's also needed to defeat another giant, and that is the giant of failure. The giant of failure. You might want to remember this. The giant of fear and the giant of failure never fight fair. They always gang up on you. How many watch? No, don't raise your hand. But if you've ever watched the world, wide world of wrestling or whatever they call it, the big wide world of wrestling, uh, the, it's, it's from the States. Those, those guys ought to get an Oscar. Those are some of the best actors you ever saw. But, but at any rate, if, you, if, you've ever, if you've ever watched that, you, you understand this term. They're, they have tag team. They're a tag team. In other words, they work in a pair, and one of them would be out in the middle, and he'll be wrestling, and, and he'll throw the other guy up against the rope, and when he hits the rope, the guy on the outside grabs him around the neck, hits him in the head, throws him back, and, and they're teaming up. They don't fight fair. Well, that's what the, that's what the giant of, of fear and the giant of failure do. They're, they're a tag team. They're a tag team. In other words, the giant of fear will knock you down. Giant of fear will cause you to fall. And while you're down on the ground, you know what the giant of failure does? He comes and puts his foot on your neck and holds you there and won't let you back up. That's the giant of failure. That, that's why the wise man said this in Proverbs 24, verse 16, a just man falleth seven times. And lays there, feeling sorry for himself. No, that's in the Crocker version of the Bible. No, that's, that's not what, no, a, 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 a just man falls seven times, and then he gets up again. He gets up. How does he do that? Stone of determination. That's how. Stone of determination. Example. The giant of fear. You know the story. The giant of fear won a great victory when the apostle Peter, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, the apostle Peter, we find him as he denies that he even knows who Jesus is. Doesn't just deny that he knows who Jesus is, he denies with, with swearing and then with cursing. De denies that he even knows who who the Lord Jesus Christ is. What a terrible fall that was, but I'm glad to tell you his fall was not fatal. 
the fall was not fatal. The apostle Peter used the stone of determination, and, 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 and even though he was down and, and the giant of failure was trying to hold him down, I want you to notice that with that stone of determination, he was able to do three things. First of all, he repented of his sin. The Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 75, that, that he went out and he, he wept bitterly. He went out and wept bitterly. In other words, he did the very same thing that the apostle, or that the psalmist rather, spoke of in Psalm 32, verse number 5, when he said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That's exactly what happened in the life of the Apostle Peter. With the stone of determination, yes, he had fallen, and yes, the giant of failure was trying to hold him down, but with the stone of determination, he was able to win the victory. He repented of his sin. Not only did he repent of his sin, he returned to his place. He returned to his place. It's interesting that after you find Peter in the alley, weeping bitterly and confessing his sin, the next time we find him mentioned, you know where he is? He's in the upper room. He went back to his place. Isn't it a sad thing that so many times Christians fall? They fall and, and they feel such a sense of guilt because of the giant of failure who's trying to hold them down that the first thing they do is they drop out of church. What a tragedy that is. What, what a foolish thing that is. But, but Peter understood the importance, and so, and so because of that, he, he returned to his place. And so he was present when the women came with their report that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He was there. He heard that. And not only that, he, he, he was present when the Lord Jesus later that same evening appeared in the upper room. Even though the doors were locked, he just appeared in their midst. Peter saw that. He was there when Jesus gave the invitation. He said, touch my hands. Touch my hands. Feel the print of the nails. T touch my side. Feel, feel the print of the spear. T touch me and see that, that I'm flesh. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit because the spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like I have. T touch me and see. Peter was there. He saw that. He saw that. He repented of his sin. He returned to his place. And then not only that, I want you to notice because of that stone of determination, he responded to his call. You remember the Lord Jesus had told Peter one time, said, I'm giving you some keys I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, and I'm going to have you to use those keys to open the door of salvation, to open the door of salvation to all people. That's why you find him using that key in Acts chapter 2 when he opens the door for the Jew. In Acts chapter 8, you find him using the key to open the door of salvation for the Samaritans. You find him using that key to open the door in Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles when he goes to visit the house of Cornelius. In other words, you find the apostle Peter as he's responding to the call that God had given to him. He failed, yes, but it wasn't fatal. He failed, yes, but the giant of failure could not hold him down. He repented of his sin. He returned to his place. He responded to his call. He fulfilled God's plan and God's purpose for his life. All of us, at some point, will be confronted by the giant of fear. And we'll be so concerned about what other people might think or say or do that, that we will fall, we'll sin. And when that happens, the giant of failure is going to come. With words of guilt, words of shame, he's going to try to hold you down and cause you to feel totally useless to God. But I want you to understand that with the stone of determination, again, a stone that is made by an absolute confidence in the faithful promises of God. That with that stone of determination, no matter how great our fall, no matter how great our failure, 
we can emerge from the field of battle victorious. We, we can emerge from the field of battle victorious, and we can become a useful instrument in the hand of our Savior. Now, I don't know exactly where each one of you may be in your personal life. It may be that the giant of fear has already caused you to fall. And it may be that the giant of failure is holding you down and, 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 and you feel like that never again will you ever be able to do anything for God, that never again will you be able to be used by God in any way. But I, I just want to tell you that with a solid confidence in the promises of God, you can have a stone of determination in your arsenal that will allow you to be victorious. May God help that to be true for every one of us.